Today's podcast is sponsored by Kari. That's K-A-U-R-I-W-I-N-E dot com. Like the native New Zealand wood. That's K-A-U-R-I-W-I-N-E dot com. Kari, who very thankful they were sponsored most, uh, or this whole season really. Uh, and they specialize in organic yeast and nutrients, but not just that. Not just products like all their tanks and Braumeisters and barrels and all that. Uh, they're much more than suppliers. They are technical experts, and um, yeah, they're there for you to ask questions. They run trials. They do lots of lab work. They're available as a sounding board or problem solving. If you have any personal experience with winemaking, you know there are problems that arise. There's funny things that happen, and uh, Kari and their expert team are somebody you can call to help out with these types of issues. So along with their products, you get great knowledge on how to use them and how to solve all the other issues in your winery and brewery. Just hit them up, drop them a line. That's kariwine.com. Just pick up New Zealand or Australia, depending on what country you're in, and take it away. We're also sponsored by Decibel Wines. I'm off to the U.S. tomorrow, and by the time you're listening to this, I'll be in Oklahoma or Texas or someplace that doesn't get enough Hawks Bay or Martinborough wines. So if you're in the U.S., you can use the promo code DBPODCAST. And you can get 10% off your first order direct from our website, and we will ship it to anywhere in the U.S., direct to your doorstep. That includes the newly released Testify Reserve Giblet Gravels Malbec and the 2016 single vineyard dry-farmed, organically-run Martin Bro Pinot Noir. Uh, we can ship to many other places now throughout New Zealand, Australia, the EU, all over the EU, Singapore, Japan, Hong Kong. And of course, the UK, Brexiters, no fear, we can still ship you wine. Just visit decibelwines.com, click Shop Decibel Wines, and choose your flag. Very easy. Okay, Willie D. Just like that, it's the last episode of this season. Uh, as I said in the uh, little ads at the beginning, I'm off to the States for a while and doing some traveling throughout September. We'll regroup in October, hope to do uh, a few of the people I missed here in Hawke's Bay, possibly some other stuff in the coming months where I'm traveling and we might come up with something interesting as I, uh, I don't want to get too into that, but I'm going to some other countries and if I can lug my podcast equipment on, maybe we'll do some more. Um, but for this last episode, we brought it back to New Zealand after three great conversations in Sydney. And geez, what can I say about Michael Brakovich? He's, uh, he and his family own and run one of New Zealand's most iconic brands in Kumi River. Uh, he's been a part of some of the great big stepping stones in New Zealand wine. He is a master of wine, which is no small feat. We talk about that a bit and, uh, you know, how he was able to achieve that. And on top of all that, he's just a great guy. Uh, he and his family are great. His 81 year old mom was very much on the scene when I stopped by the winery last week. I spoke with his brother Milan who, uh, runs the vineyards and who I've met a few times over the year. There's just all great people making great wines. We tasted some of the 2018s after the podcast finished up, uh, that was in barrel and they're looking just great and kind of funky too. You know, we speak about their style of Chardonnay with wild ferments, solid contacts, different clones, their vineyards outside of Auckland, all that history, different trellising they use, and uh, and of course their new venture in Hawke's Bay, which I'm excited to see what happens. I think they've just released their first Hawke's Bay Sauvignon Blanc, if I'm not misunderstood. Uh, anyways, a great conversation, and here it is. <music> Right, we are live now after a uh, beautiful coffee accident <laughs> to wake me up. There's two ways you can use coffee. One is to drink it, or the other is spill it on yourself and wake yourself up. Uh, well, thanks for having me here and taking some time. I really no appreciate worries. it. Glad we could work it out. Um, 
and I did ask you where you were born. You were born just up the road in Helensville, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, family operation here, so that kind of yep. makes sense, you know. Yeah. Well, I started here in 1944. Um, my father was 19. And he worked with his parents on this farm and uh, developed it into a winery. It was not grapes to start, or uh, there was about a half an acre of grapes when they purchased it, and that was part of the attraction. Yeah. But it was essentially a dairy farm. Mm. And so they milked cows, mostly for, in those days it was for cream and they kept pigs as well here. Yeah, so, and they also grew strawberries. They had a small orchard and they grew pumpkins. And any of that still on the property? Any of anything besides grapes still here? Or? Well, we, um, in the mid sixties, dad bought an adjoining farm and that became his hobby of growing dry stock. You know, we had about 20, 25 head of cattle on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we still run three head, but th- most of that farm has been planted in grapes. Yeah. And Chardonnay. And Chardonnay. Yep. Lots of Chardonnay. Yep. So uh, the region, you have how many Chardonnay vineyards basically within this region? Uh, well, Chardonnay is about three quarters of our production. So um, we've got 30 hectares of our own. Uh, we purchased from another 10 hectares worth of growers in Kumu. Mm-hmm. Plus then now we've got a grower in Hawke's Bay. We also have, heard a this. Yeah. We, we have a vineyard in Hawke's Bay as well. Um, but just going back to the Kumu end of things, uh, yeah, three quarters of it is Chardonnay. So what's that? It's at least 25 hectares of, mm. of Chardonnay. But we also grow Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris. And you guys have survived the assault on Chardonnay that uh, came, what, 10, 15 years ago? And now it's... The so-called ABC movement. Yes. Uh, yeah, anything but Chardonnay. Uh, yeah. Um, but, I mean, we were in the game a long way before then. Exactly. So, yeah, um, yeah we, we had established a reputation in, by the mid-'80s for Chardonnay. And in the U.S., uh, it started in 1988 with our 87 vintage. So we started exporting through Wilson Daniels in those days. And uh, we, we've been there ever since, but, but also at, at about the same time in the UK. Mm. And the UK has become our biggest export market. Yeah, the US is, uh, well, it's interesting. I've sent a lot of my wine there, but uh, I have seen over the years, even before I came to New Zealand, I saw your wines over there. And they're mm-hmm. one of the, probably one of the things I couldn't quite get my head around until I actually visited this region um but then again i knew nothing of hawks bay before i moved there uh and it's great to hear that you're uh getting some hawks bay is it all chardonnay down there or no uh Uh, in fact the vineyard that we bought is predominantly sauvignon blanc so we've we've made one this year Uh, most of those grapes are actually sold but um we also have chardonnay and pinot noir on that block so oh cool we we are we have already pulled out a bit of the Sauvignon Blanc and we will be replanting. It's about four hectares this year of Chardonnay. Great. Uh, so, um, Any exciting clones or anything like that? Uh, the two clones that we're planting there are UCD15, which mm-hmm. has been very successful for us here, and also uh, clone 548. From is that the Valley Road uh, site or is there yes. somewhere? Yeah. yeah. So it's, down, it's Ray's Road, which is just yeah. off Valley Road. And what was this, Clone 15, and what was the other one, sorry? Uh, 548. 548, So okay. that's a Dijon clone. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we, we've trialed the 548 and 1066 here for the last few years, and very happy with, particularly with the 548. Yeah. Now we've seen a lot of great Clone 15 as well down there, so you should have, it's a nice mix. Yeah. Uh, it's great to hear you're in Hawke's Bay. We'll welcome with open arms another great Thank uh, you. Uh, great winery down that way um particularly if uh, will there be some designated hawks bay wines coming out of there so single vineyard kind of hawks bay well we it's very early days Mm. um this is our 2018 was our first vintage uh and so far we have produced a sauvignon blanc which has just recently been bottled and is on the market now so that's under the cumia river label um, I like Hawks Bay Savvy. That was what, the first yeah. wine I made, and I find, uh, particularly if you're in the States, that style is, uh, it seems to turn, whether it's the average punter or the Psalm, they're expecting one thing and they get something else, which yeah. is much more tropical. And yeah, 
well, this one isn't. Because, okay. Because it's at, <laughs> at a bit more altitude, so it's it, it it's quite austere, mm-hmm. quite flinty. I'll get you to taste it later on. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, quite quite mineral, so it doesn't have the tropicals at all. Mm. Um, so it's yeah, it's different. Yeah. Um, and uh, backing up to this region. Um, what, when, why Chardonnay? Was that was what was here when you first took it over in oh, 40s? No. Or, no, no, know, no, or was no. it Muller um, Turgau or something? It wasn't even that. Uh, the half acre that was here when they first arrived in 44 was Albany Surprise. <laughs> which, <laughs> that uh, doesn't sound good. I don't no, know what that is. No, but it's, Well, it's uh, La Broscana. Okay. So, so yeah. it's from New York State, yeah. from Albany. And uh, that was a red grape that they used to make everything from. Okay. And so there was a lot of that type of hybrid thing sure. going on. Then when uh, Dad planted the vineyard across the road, which has subsequently become Matty's Vineyard, he had quite a mixture of grape varieties in there, including Palomino, mm. Pinotage, Baco 22A, uh, Seibel 5455. And this Seibel. is all 60s and 70s? This is in yeah. the 50s. 50s, and 60, okay. Yeah. So Seibel 5455 and 5437. Uh, he also planted Cabernet Sauvignon. Then in the mid-60s, he planted Chardonnay just on the side of the road, and um, Mulaturgau. Mm. In those days, we referred to Mulaturgau as Riesling, because it was Riesling Silvana as we knew it then. And it wasn't until uh, Nick Nobolo produced a Mulaturgau in the uh, 70s that it started to be correctly named. Yeah. And at that time, uh, so you're a your kid at that time, you're, uh, uh, and Nick is obviously a lot older than you, but you kind of know about the sort of pioneers of the wine Absolutely, in that, in that yeah. area. They're friends with your dad. They're kind of, yeah. That's right. Uh, and dad was very much involved in industry politics. Right. From a very early age, he was uh, secretary of the Viticultural Association, which was mostly uh, Croatian growers yeah, sure. in West Auckland. So there were a few different industry organisations at the time. So he was in the Viticultural Association. There was also the Wine Council of New Zealand and Hawke's Bay uh, Grape Growers. Mm. So the three entities merged in 1976 under the title of the Wine Institute of New Zealand. So Dad, oh, okay. Dad was very much involved in the formation of that and was a member of the executive for a long time, including a stint as uh, chairman during the 1980s. I always wondered why... I think it's our levy payments still say Wine Institute of New Zealand, or at least they used to. They used to. I, yeah. it's, it's just changed. Just changed. Just okay. changed the last yeah. year. Yeah, and there so. you have it. So, um, yeah, so that would have been some pretty interesting times. I sat next to Nick at a dinner a few years back, and he had some, some pretty cool stories about barrel fermented Chardonnay in the early Excellent. 70s and yep. things like that. So, um but it became evident pretty quick for you guys that you loved the way the Chardonnay responded to this region? Yes, well, uh, after all that early development, um, we started planting newer vineyards here and uh, in, in what amounted as a fairly large-scale viticultural experiment. So we planted Cabernet Sauvignon, Chardonnay Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc on the farm just across the road. And then a few years after that, we had the opportunity to buy from Corbin's Wines, mm. quite a large property. It was a 100-acre farm uh, up in Waitakere Road, which had on it a, a number of different grape varieties. It had a lot of Palomino, uh, some Mulaturgau, uh, a lot of Barco 22A, a variety called Golden Queen, which you never see around it anymore. Sounds like an apple or something. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> well, peach variety, but uh, <laughs> this was a table grape variety. And um, some 5455 as well. Uh, but the big attraction was uh, 20 acres of Merlot, which was one of the few Merlot blocks in the country. The mm. other one at the time was uh, at uh, Matafero in, in sure. Gisborne. Yep. Uh, so Corbin's had produced one of the first big commercial blocks of Merlot, and uh, that, that was the main attraction. We, we bought that land in early 1983, and then later on the same year, I had the opportunity to go to France and work for Jean-Pierre Moix at uh, Chateau Petrus and Chateau Magdalene. So that was a that was a good introduction to Merlot. And at the time, we, we thought Merlot was going to be it for us. So um, it's probably all these things, but, um, you know, a combination of 
pioneers in New Zealand, probably Europeans and maybe Americans being uh, very interested in what was going on down here as I, uh, I was and everything, but you know, we're talking maybe 20 years before that. Uh, the fact that you guys were clearly at that stage, you must have been producing some very quality wines to be given that opportunity and that, uh, you know, you're, you have some European ties for in your history and uh, that, you know, dad and your family are clearly all, all right people, you know, that are good people. And, you know, you've met so-and-so over the years and went to this tasting just as it was probably a much smaller community back then. So you well, had these yeah. opportunities Yep. open up for you um what i be did i miss anything there or no, would, no, it, that's it, exactly right because it was a small industry dad knew everybody um we we got to know people from overseas as well you know people like maynard amory came and visited uh, he came as a guest judge at the national wine competition as it was at the time and um, got to know him uh, bryce rankin did the same thing dr bryce rankin mm -hmm. from south australia and when, when he um, went to become head of school at Roseworthy Agricultural College and the Enology School there, uh, that, that coincided with the time that I went as well. So that, that was a great opportunity to get out of New Zealand and go to a different country uh, with its own winemaking tradition and very good, very good history of uh, technical expertise and, yeah. in Enology. So... Um, that that was a key to to move. And what year was that roughly? Or? I was there, nineteen seventy nine, eighty, eighty one. So, um, yeah. Did you find you know huge leaps and bounds over there compared Absolutely. to? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. we we thought we knew a few things about wine, and I got there my first year. I realised we didn't know very much, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's set about learning as much as possible. Yeah. Oh, well, that would have been pretty cool. It, it was I amazing, think, yeah. amazing time, and. Uh, yeah, the the viticultural um, head of the, the head of department of the viticultural section was uh, Dr. Richard Smart, so I got to know him very well, and I did my third year project with Richard uh, on a vineyard in Kunawara, and then in 1981 got to work the harvest for Mildara wines in Kunawara, which again amazing experience. Yeah, to be able to work um, alongside a winemaker like Jack Schultz and um, that area, I think, is still one of the most highly underrated Cabernet areas in the world. It, yeah, I've it, seemed to get my hand on a few of them over the years, and they're always just, you know, it's like getting your hand on a Napa Cab. They're just oh, deliver, they're, man. They yeah. are so good. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, what it, because Coonawarra is so isolated, uh, it's very hard to get labour there. So mm. it was one of the first uh, areas in Australia to really go down the pathway of mechanisation, both in harvesting mm. and in pruning. And pruning. I think that that's kind of compromised a lot of the quality, uh, but still the best vineyards, and if they're looked after well, they, they make, I think, the best red wine in Australia, yeah. hands down. Yeah, no, I've had some good ones. Um, and then when do you think, uh, if there was, was it always just sort of a slow build with Kumi River wines, or was it, you know, do you think there was some turning points and big moments for you guys? There were a couple of key moments. Um, <clears throat> first one was our 1983 Merlot, which you know, I, uh, we, we had made early in that vintage um, and then subsequently had the chance to go to France and learn a bit more about it. But uh, it made an impact straight away. We, we entered it in the National Wine Competition, it won a gold medal, mm -hmm. and straight away it was it was well known. You yeah. arrived, yeah. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was the opportunity to introduce the new label because up until then we were San Marino vineyards. Oh. And, uh, you know, the implication of a name like that, especially in Australia, was that it's probably from the Riverland, it's, you know, Italian immigrants, it's yeah. not very good. Uh, so we, we decided to start to use the, um, the area name, mm. Kumu. And, uh, we are located on the banks of the Kumi River, even though it's just a bit of a creek. Yeah. Um, and that name has now now become. Is that an uh, old Māori name or? It is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And is there? Do you know the meaning? Or yep. it, I'm, I'm guess you do. Yep. It's, um, <laughs> kume is uh, is a verb to pull or tug at, and u is a breast. Uh huh. So you figure it out. Yes. Okay cool name <laughs> i'll think of that next time i'm drinking one of your voluptuous chardonnays you know um 
Well, uh, and then I, one of my first introductions to Kumi River was like when I lived in Philadelphia running a restaurant, I was researching. I just became obsessed with New Zealand wines and they kept, pop, you know, your wines kept popping up and did this book and that book. And uh, one of the things was a, a relationship with some California producers. And I'm guessing that came sort of late 80s. Is that what you said? Uh, well, we, we got to know Bob Mondavi quite yeah. well. And, um, uh, there was a bit of a trade back and forth, kind of, or just visits or something? More more visits. Yeah. Um, because uh, they, they were looking for an importer in New Zealand. Uh, my father and mother went and visited them uh, in the mid 80s and th they got on very well and, and the company that we were associated with uh, at the time it was called uh, Kitchener Wines um, became the importers of Mondavi wines and so to, to introduce the brand to the New Zealand market we had a bit of a barbecue here at the winery, mm -hmm. at which uh, Bob Mondavi and Margaret were here. And, and they did a couple of trips to New Zealand. But I was always amazed at um, his generosity of spirit you know, when it came to wine. And it was, it was obvious when you saw him in action around the world. And I, I saw him a few times um, at the New York Wine Experience. But he realized that um, th the most important thing for him to do as a wine ambassador for California and for Mondavi was firstly to promote wine because it wasn't really yeah, a beverage yeah. of choice at the time. Yeah. Secondly, to promote American wine. Thirdly, to promote California wine. Mm -hmm. And if he did those three, well, Mondavi was going to come along for the ride anyway. Sure. So, so he did that in that in that respect. And I remember doing a um, a winemaker's dinner with him at a restaurant on the North Shore. Um, and we had both Mondavi wines and some of our wines as well. Um, you know, it was promoting it to wine enthusiasts. And he got up and he just spoke about our wine. He didn't talk about his wine at all. <laughs> you know, and I, I thought, what an amazing guy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we just don't seem to have many of those characters left, unfortunately. He, he was a, a one-off. Yeah, yeah. And I like the idea. I, I love the idea of... Um you know, a wine dinner with two different wineries and buddies. And I mean, that's really what it's about and what I try to do a lot as well. I've, it's so much more fun, you know? It is. And I've done a few of them uh, with, with people like Rudy Bauer from Quartz Reef and uh, Larry McKenna fr from Escarpment. And basically we, we get up and talk about each other's wines, not our own. Yeah. And, and it's, it's really good because the people who are there get a different perspective and they really love it. Because, yeah, and I think like there's something wine. about being so close to your own wines that, you know, whether it's, you know, it's, unfortunately, sometimes you're saying the same thing about it if you're out in the trade, but um, there's something fresh about somebody who's also, you know, quote unquote, an expert in the field that can appreciate your wine, roughly knows how it's made and can, but can really appreciate why it's so great. And, uh, and to have them sort of speak on your behalf or vice versa is, is fun. And, uh, you, you know, I always try to do it because you always come off looking like the good guy, too. <laughs> you know? um, so, uh, well, that's, that's great. And then, uh, you know, the big MW on the end of your name, when did, that, when did you start going down that endeavor? Um, it goes back to, I think it was 1986. Um, I was a judge at the... Uh, it was in the Air New Zealand Wine Awards at the Chateau Tongariro. It's quite a, a small wine show in those days. But we always would have a guest overseas judge. And that, that particular year, the guest judge was Sarah Morphew, who was the first woman to pass the MW exam back in the early, uh, early 70s. Mm -hmm. And she was the current chair of the Institute of Masters of Wine. Uh, she tapped me on the shoulder after judging with her one day and said look uh, have you ever thought of doing the mw exam and i just you know certainly had heard about the mws what what the exam entailed and held these people in a kind of awe yeah but um you know realized it was a british wine trade qualification you had to have worked five years in the british wine trade before you can even attempt it but she said, no, no, we're, we're going to be announcing soon that uh, we're going to open up the exam to internationals, that it won't just be the British wine trade. Mm. Uh, as long as you have five years' experience in the trade, um, you'll be able to you know, enter if you qualify 
to get in, then you can do the exam. And I didn't think much more of it because you know it was a big commitment, and um, you know I didn't really think it it would be possible. Yeah, that's the first thing that would cross my mind is uh, when I I'm like, how did Michael do it? You know, yeah. he's running this you know emerging. Uh, brand and uh, you know where do you get the time? Obviously, you have some people that help you out a lot. And well, you know. yes, it worked out that way. That, you know, I I basically parked it, didn't even think about it. And then uh, in 1988, uh, Michael Hillsmith uh, became the first international MW. He passed the exam, but Michael had had moved to London and was working there and was doing the exam based in London. Uh, when that result was announced, I got a phone call from Sarah Morphy and saying, look, you, know, you should really think about this because it's possible. You know, Michael Hillsmith's done it. You should have a, a crack at it and do it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I felt a bit bullied and uh, thought I better, I better give it a go. <laughs> so um, I um, submitted a, an essay, which you had to do. Okay. Um, uh, got accepted into the study course, but of course the study course was being run in London, so there was, uh, there was no possibility. Yeah, of it wasn't like that an online going, course or something no, at that stage. No, there, yeah. there, there was nothing like that. And there were a few, there were a few lectures and tutorials and things and tastings in London that students could go to and be mentored and that type of thing. So we didn't have that, but um, at the same time, Bob Campbell was was also interested in doing the exam and so we got together as a tasting group of two yeah but uh sam weaver who's a, a winemaker in marlborough at Churton, mm. uh, he was then working at hancock's and sam had already passed the mw tasting part of the exam uh, but ne- unfortunately never got around to finishing the theory part so he hasn't become an mw but you know a really good winemaker and really good taster but he set up tastings for Bob and I uh, along MW lines. Mm. And he would buy the wines, serve them blind, and then give us the bill afterwards. Yeah. Because <laughs> otherwise you'd be biased as to what, what yeah. you were tasting. Do you want me to shut that? Just, no, uh, it's okay. It's, that's all right. Just, um, um, the... So on the theory side, I imagine I can take a guess on what the tasting side is, is that, you know, you're tasting wines of the world blind and trying to guess different things. And, uh, but on the theory side, uh, has that, has an MW traditionally come from the trade? When you say the trade, is that more in the sales trade or the marketing trade as opposed to, you know, because you don't, you know. I mean, it's a British wine trade. Yeah. And in the 50s So there's not 60s, many winemakers. <laughs> well, there, there weren't then. Yeah. There are now. Yeah. Uh, and the trade was the traditional merchant trade. So yeah. the whole Master of Wine thing uh, came about post-World War II when the trade realised that uh, it was never going to be quite the same again and that they needed some more expertise and that there needed to be more training within the trade uh, to, to up the skill and knowledge so that that's where the why, why wasn't going to be the same again i mean obviously from the war's sake like because the industry had been affected so heavily in france you mean or something um, like that well i'll have to paraphrase the story as it was told to me by the late david stevens who was the chair of the institute at the time i passed the exam and the way he told it was the life of a london wine merchant between the wars was a pretty leisurely one yeah so he would catch the train and from the home counties, go to his office by about 9.30, taste the samples that had been sent in, dictate a bit of correspondence, read some correspondence. Then 12.30 he would go to lunch at his club. (laughs) And lunch was normally an hour and a half or two hours and there would always be claret. Yeah, of course. And um, then he would come back to the office uh, sign the letters that he dictated in the morning, maybe look at another couple of samples, but then he'd be on the train home by 3.30, 4 o'clock, hmm. so he could be home by 5.30. And uh, th- that was the, the day of a wine merchant. Hmm. Uh, post-World War II, uh, everything changed. I sure. mean, the, the whole fabric of uh, society in the UK changed forever, and it became much more competitive and... Um, 
there, there was a lot, a lot bigger population. The economy was changing rapidly, so um, things had to move, mm. and it was no longer an hereditary title almost. Sure, you sure. Know, you, you actually had to work and 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 be better at it. And uh, France certainly changed after the war. I mean, the, you know, the story I tell is about uh, oak in white burgundy. You know, in the old days, before World War II, um, barrels were just a container. Mm. You know, that, that's what wine was made in. Mm. And occasionally you might renew your containers because they were getting a bit old. Um, but during World War II, a lot of it was neglected. A lot of barrels went off, got vinegary. And so... Post World War Two, most of them had to be replaced, and so the coopers had to get busy and replace a lot of um, older cooperages with new. And all, all of a sudden, new oak became a thing, mm. and because it, people tasted it and went, "Whoa, that's right, yeah. went, whoa, this looks good." So, yeah. and then when people like Mondavi visited Burgundy and saw the same type of thing, I mean, that, that's where he got the idea to to start buying French oak. I mean, the the easiest thing you can do to emulate white burgundies by the same barrels as they did. Sure. So that's how all that happened. But we became a little bit wedded to uh, New Oak. Yeah. And it's changing. We did a a World War II tasting in Hawke's Bay a few years back, and it was just mind-blowing. First of all, that you were tasting wines that old. I would say one of the, I think, eight wines we had was a little bit of a, had a bit of a formic acid kind of, twinge to it but it was still a nice wine but all the other ones were amazing it was almost like shedding a tear of what yeah. how, what went through to get these wines to yeah. us at this stage and uh, Jenny Dobson was there with this big book in French and she was translating this basically the problems they went through you know there was no diesel there was no labor there was you know the, what they had to do to get these wines made yeah. was was remarkable but I've never thought about all the changes that would have come post-war and that quick up pivot to what it's what things are going to happen now that mm. that point about oak is something i really have to get my head get my head around and think about that's an interesting one because it's like a reset you know yeah and yeah. and so the whole french industry got reset a bit like after phylloxera too i mean that sure that had a big effect on it and and just all of a sudden um the urbanization of france as well you know prior to world war ii there was so many people working in the countryside a lot of them didn't have jobs anymore, had to you know, move to towns, and consumption of wine started to decrease. But the appreciation of quality was much more because as a rural economy, people used to just drink wine because it was a part of what sure. they did every day, and it was a very important source of calories for people working on the land. But now it was becoming more and more something that um, people appreciated and were willing to pay a bit more for if it was good. Mm. So the fine wine trade really started about that time. And uh, something like the Institute of Masters of Wine was a- appealing to that sector of the trade that wanted to have a qualification. And then subsequently the Wine and Spirit Education Trust um, was formed as well. Uh, it was all under the auspices of the Vintners Company. Mm. And the Vintners Company is one of the old guild hall uh, companies from the City of London that goes back, now it's over... It's so 650 years old. It's, it's pretty remarkable when you yeah, think about amazing. this, uh, you know, this effort into whether it's the Masters of Wine, but overall, you know, how London has, you know, clearly supported so much of uh, mainland European wines, particularly French wines, for so many years. But that training that started back then would have clearly had an effect on why New Zealand wine, I mean, outside of the fact that Commonwealth. Uh, that New Zealand wine was quickly picked up in well, yeah, the UK before everywhere else, you know? It's because we're a Commonwealth country and we have these very strong historic ties. But if I go back a step, so, you know, why, why was the UK such a big market for Europe? It was because it was wealthy. Mm. Because the UK had its empire, its Commonwealth, it had shipping all around the world. They had these colonies in India and China, and, mm. you know, it, it, it became very wealthy very quickly, and then they, they had the Industrial Revolution as well. So there was a customer base within the UK that had the money to be able to discern and buy better and better quality, which, which is why Bordeaux really took off early. It was the first one to go down that uh, classification path, 
but also because it was easily accessible by boat. Yeah. And the same with Portugal. Got to have a good port, right? Burgundy, <laughs> uh, less so, but it still had the canal system, so you mm-hmm. could ship relatively easy out of Burgundy. Burgundy, much bigger connection with Paris. But um, so that, that's why the British wine trade became so important, because they, they had the money. And then New Zealand coming in really in the mid to late 80s. I mean, we, I went with my brother Paul in 1988 to the London Wine Trade Fair, um, as, and New Zealand was the featured nation at that fair, and it was awesome. I mean, just the reception we got was incredible, because we had come a long way in a very short time. Yeah. And we speak the same language, and they like us, because, you yeah. know, we, we understand cricket, I mean, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, it counts, and, and us and the Australians made a big impact at, at about that time. Yeah, and do you, uh, on those trips, you know, what other New Zealand wines were you seeing? And, you know, obviously had some buddies in the trade. Uh, sure, I mean, the, the people we were touring with are people like Bill Spence from Matua Valley, John Hancock, who was uh, then at um, uh, Morton Estate, and... Um, Nick Nobolo from Nobolo's, uh, Rose Delegate was there from Delegates, Michael Selak from Selak Swines. Mm-hmm. So there, there was quite a group, and you know, the big companies like Montana were involved as well. Um, so it was quite it, it was quite a collegial atmosphere, and we we did it together, um, and made made a very big impact. And I think we we haven't really looked back from then. Yeah, Jane Hunter from from Hunters as well. So. It's, um, so it was always important then for us, we at the time weren't really interested in the US market. We thought, you know, too big, too hard, we'll concentrate on the UK and that'll be it. But at that wine trade fair in 1988 was when we met uh, Wynne Wilson and Jack Daniels and they really liked our wine and, and really wanted it. And um, so we, we've been with them just about ever since. Mm-hmm. And um, that that was unusual. You know, we we didn't realise that, that the wines were going to get quite that amount of uh, recognition straight away. But uh, yeah, they they came, tasted the wines. I said we we'd like to take you to dinner. You know, so Paul and I got scrubbed up straight after the wine show, headed off to their their hotel, which was the Four Seasons Hotel, of course, in the park at, uh, <laughs> in Park Lane, and we had dinner there and. Sitting d- down to dinner, and Jack goes, "Oh, look, they've got Romani Conti uh, Grands Issues, so 1971 on the list. Let's have that." <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> we you said go. your dinner, right? <laughs> you invited us, right? <laughs> and you know, but but we realised then they were pitching to us. They they wanted us. And, yeah. And I mean, by, by the end of that dinner, I thought, "Well, oh, yeah, yeah, we'll give Ma- it a go. Maybe we will look at the US." <laughs> <laughs> sure. And they said. Um, are you going to France? Do you want to visit the domain? Oh yeah, sure. So, so they arranged. You know, within a couple of days, we we were visiting uh, Domaine de Romani Conti. Right. Fantastic trip. Yeah, that sounds like uh, heydays. What year was that around? Uh, that was eighty eight. Eighty eight. So um, yeah, right at the sort of beginning of the boom, Marlborough would have been you know expl- just about to explode or exploding. Yeah. Um, and uh, you mentioned, Paul, what's the, f- the family as it is now an in involvement right. in the, the business? Okay, so there's our mother, Melba, who's uh, still very much in charge, and she works here in the shop from time to time. She's, she's 81 now. Uh, I'm the eldest of the children, so I look after the, um, the winemaking side of things. Then there's Mariana, my sister, who's, who's been with us. She was the last one to join us, but she had a career in the in the hotel business. But she's been here quite a number of years now, looking after a lot of the accounting side of things and some of the marketing. Uh, Milan is a trained engineer, so he, when he came back into the industry, this is uh, in the mid '80s. Um, he was working in the dairy business, um, in cheese and butter, but but was really keen to come back home. So. He came back and started looking after the vineyards, which I was doing at the time. Um, so then it was um, me and the winery, him and the vineyards, but his engineering expertise. I've met, I met him a couple of times. He's a great guy. Across all of the uh, yeah. disciplines. And so he's 
he, he's done a great job in yeah. both winery and vineyard and he continues to look after the vineyards and all that engineering stuff and and paul who's got a degree in marketing uh, looks after sales and marketing great and and, and does a lot of the export stuff we, got it, you got it all covered you know we we have and we all delve into each other's fields from time sure. to time and and we kind of share the uh, traveling around because there's a fair bit of travel involved in various markets yeah well that's i would say a distinct advantage is uh you know your whether it's a uh, you know like i i uh, first met Milan at Texom a few years ago oh, right. and uh, we did a, he was part of a lunch we did there and I thought well isn't this great like anybody from the family can, you know because you all have uh, you know uh, great knowledge of not only of the wines but of just wine in itself so uh, he can step up and talk on behalf of the family it's great you know so uh, we've small restaurant family business but we back home but we don't, don't have to <laughs> go out on marketing trips like that <laughs> quite as much uh, but you could find any one of our faces behind the bar at any yeah, time anytime, yeah. uh, so that's helpful um, and uh, yeah because I was here I'm sure I've met some of you guys I was here when I was a budding viticultural student uh, at EIT back in 2010 and distinctly remember your barrel ferment room as being one of the more fascinating rooms in the industry I'd ever seen, uh, uh, everything's sort of ticking away. I'm sure we were here in sep October, probably, and, uh, been going. yeah, yeah, and everything was sort of bubbling away, and even the thought of there could have been a primary still going, possibly over here and there, and, you know, to uh, somebody who, at that stage, was just uh, really, you know, by the book, literally, uh, it was pretty cool to see uh, some funky stuff going on at a high level as well. It wasn't just some basement operation. It was obviously some serious things happening. And at that point, uh, I think I was just blown away. We tasted at least four Chardonnays that day in the tasting room and just each one distinctly different. And uh, so I had a good time here. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, I, I suppose, is that a, a bit of a mantra here as far as sort of kind of old school barrel fermentation, you know, with, uh, but still technically sound winemaking? Yeah. Um, I mean, I was taught in Australia, so very much the kind of technocratic way of doing things and a lot of theory based. Yeah. So, so trying to understand what's going on. But having worked in France in 83 um, at Chateau Magdalene and Petrus at the time as well, it was all wild yeast fermentation. So to get to see that firsthand and how easy it was and how good it was uh, gave us the encouragement to try it here in 1984 with reds, but not with whites, just a little bit, bit hesitant with that. Mm -hmm. And once we'd done it for a couple of years, then Millen and Nigel Tibbetts, who was our cellar master, still here, still a very good winemaker and, and a, a huge input to our styles as well. Uh, they said, well, look, if it worked for the Reds, why don't we try it on the Whites as well? And from 1986 onwards, we, we went down the wild, wild East path and um, haven't looked back. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things, what, once you understand or think you understand what's going on, then uh, nothing really goes wrong. Not that there's huge secrets about this or anything, but is it a situation where you guys are, you know, pulling into the lab, looking at uh, populations, or have you more of just maintaining temperature, pH, kind of, or anything like that? Just no, you've got your culture, and here you go. We've we've never done yeast counts. Uh, that's just far too tedious. Yeah, um, and we want it to be fun. No, it, it's one of those things that uh, if you wait long enough, it's always gonna ferment. Yeah, it, sure, it, it's sure. Just there's nothing sure. Uh, it's just trying to uh, give it the best conditions under which it's not going to stick or stop. Mm. And a lot of that involves the use of oxygen. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to also use uh, nutrients, uh, primarily in the form of DAP. We, we give it a systematic quarter gram or half gram per litre addition of DAP, but we stopped that more than 10 years ago. We realised it really wasn't doing much because... Mm. Uh, by and large, we, we do have enough nitrogen in our fermentations anyway. And if we want to make use of all the nitrogen, then, then oxygen helps that because proline in particular uh, requires the presence of oxygen f for the yeast to be able to use it. So doing that, we, we have a pretty good result. 
it's a lot less certain uh, with malolactic bacteria. Yeah. So uh, we we do always purchase some cultures and and start up a few barrels with with malolactic culture. Mm. But we're just as likely to have spontaneous ones start up as well. And, and whatever's working, then we'll use those to uh, cross an oculate cross an and, yeah. and make sure the malo goes through. But yeah, if the malo doesn't go through 100%, you know, it's not the end of the world. Mm. So we we generally wait until springtime and then malos will go. But a year like this, you know, the malos have just about all gone through already, which is great. And uh, so it gives them opportunity to then settle down before they get sulfured up. Yeah, but it's all pretty basic winemaking. There's nothing particularly special about it. Uh, but much more recently, um, we, we had the University of Auckland doing a major study on Maddie's Vineyard in particular, looking at the the succession of yeasts that goes on. And I mean, we we've been using the yeast for years uh, and just knowing how it goes, but not knowing what was going on. So that that's been a great learning process for us we now know that we have a number of different species a number of different strains and most of them are unique to us so it's it's part of our terroir yeah absolutely it's something that we need to appreciate and nurture but it gets you know it's a population that that's not static it does get a new input every year because we we buy barrels yeah of and course the barrels from france contain yeast yeah. So there, there's all, there's new blood come in. Yes. Every year. Yeah. Uh, well, that's another goes back to uh, if you wanted to taste like Burgundy, get some, <laughs> uh, get some nice uh, get some figure out Burgundy. get their uh, their barrels too. Um, yeah, I suppose there is always that question about uh, native yeasts and populations in New World and how long we, you know we have and modern winemaking, how much we inhibit or or uh, or help that along. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess a quick question about Pinot Noir, because I'm a Pinot Noir producer, and yep. it's probably uh, one of the things that, well, it is one of the reasons why I moved to New Zealand. It's uh, I went to Hawke's Bay because of the school, and I thought it was close to Martinborough, and I wanted to make Martinborough Pinot, so I'm uh, eternally fascinated by Pinot Noir. Uh, and what do you guys find up here? You know, obviously it's a little more, you know, slightly more humid, a little more warmer, but guess the influences we get some ocean influences here yeah, and it's certainly more humid not necessarily warmer mm. so because the um, the oceans are very close both sides east and west um, it keeps the temperature quite moderate uh, so we have a maximum temperature of January 19 point uh, I'm sorry um, average maximum temperature in January is 19.6 so we're still very much on the cool mm. the cool kind of spectrum because of that, that cloud cover that comes about from being close to the oceans. Uh, but humidity can be a real problem, uh, especially with the variety like Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris, which, which doesn't stand up to it very well. Uh, the big advantage with Pinot here is that it ripens early. So the red Pinot is the first variety we pick, even before Chardonnay. Okay. The, the only thing that would come before it is sparkling base. Hmm. Uh, so if, if we can avoid uh, rain at that time and, and botrytis, then we get a good, resu- a good result. 2018, we didn't pick any Pinot Noir here. It just rotted on the vine and uh, it was terrible. Hmm. Uh, we, we picked about half the Pinot Gris and we were very fussy about that and it's turned out okay. Uh, but the Chardonnay is much more tolerant of that wet weather and does it humidity. start earlier here? I would imagine. Pinot. It just everything. All the yeah. Pinot starts first. Yeah, it's the first the bud burst. Everything. Yeah. Um, I'm so just thinking on the perspective of, you know, from Martinborough, for example, and certainly Otago, but definitely Martinborough. You know, we get these uh, Antarctic winds in the spring, and you know, the it's sort of natural fruit thinning. Yeah, it can cool uh, things down. Yeah. Uh, quite a bit, and and we get frosted here too. Okay. But going back to you know temperatures during January and things like that, we we get to thirty degrees one or two days a year. That's it. Yeah. The only time we've ever gone over thirty was in uh, two thousand eight. We got to thirty three on one day, but that was really humid day. We got a lot a lot of botrytis that year. So we're still in the cool climate spectrum, but dealing with a few problems with rainfall and 
humidity. If we can get dry seasons, then then we're okay. Um, the Pinot Noir, uh, we, we've had a reasonable amount of success with that in the UK at our lower level, at our village level. We, we make a very simple Pinot that sells extremely well through the wine society mm-hmm. uh, for not a lot of money. Um, and then we, we do specialise a little bit with our Hunting Hill Pinot Noir, but it's a tiny volume. And because it's all on clay soil, you get a bit more, I guess, uh, earthiness, mushroomy characters, sure. a bit more tannin. Uh, but now, uh, 2018, we've got our first vintage of Pinot from Ray's Road in Hawke's Bay. And that is on a, a limestone hillside, even though it's it's got windblown lurse on top of it. Uh, mm. The Pinot is at the shallow end of the property. And it's looking really good. I mean, yeah, Hawke's Bay Pinot is sort of uh, underrated, and there's some people that export it and do quite well with it. Um, mm. um, it's, there's actually a decent amount of plantings there as well. Uh, I just think that, you know, probably more of the winemaking side of things, people have always focused on the big reds, and then Syrah came along. and Yeah, well, you know, well it's because most of the vineyards are concentrated on the Hirotonga Plains, yeah. you know, where, where it's a lot warmer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, with this vineyard that we have, at Rose Road, it's between 180 and 200 metres altitude. And oh, really? It's, yeah. a, it's a lot cooler, yeah. uh, a bit later. And, uh, you know, I've seen what Rosie Butler's done at Lime sure. Rock. Um, you know, it's the same type of, well, not exactly the same type of soil, but, but you know, it, it's that kind of feel. Mm. Yeah, you're uh, getting so, yeah, into bit, the bit southern higher. Hawke's Bay or central Hawke's Bay feel. Yeah, yeah. a bit higher up. Um, but cooler so we actually made uh, four or five lots of Pinot this year the first bit we we did we we made some sparkling base which I'm just delighted with it's, yeah it's, it's awesome it's, it's fantastic and uh, then then we picked uh, part of the vineyard that has the old clone MV6 on it and that's turned out really well so that that's going to be our Kimi River Rays Road Pinot Noir this year and um, the rest of it, which was starting to be affected by, by botrytis, but, but we handpicked it all, yeah. cut that out, uh, is a lighter style and, and that we've, we're bottling next week for our village. Yeah, I mean, I think with Pinot, uh, the one thing I've learned over the years, you know, I, I thought I really like Martin Barrow Pinot because it's dark and structured and mushroomy and along with the elegance and all that. Um, but you know, 2017, we had to pick all in one day. Uh, we had to make some some rosé. Uh, it's a 12% wine. Mm. I think it's lovely. Yeah. You know, I drink it all day and night. You know, mm. it's and that that that's a lot harder to get away with with than Cabernet Sauvignon or, or even yeah. Syrah that for that matter. Syrahs can just come off way too peppery and exactly. And yeah. and the other thing that that we've been doing here for years is making white wine from Pinot Noir. Mm. Oh, okay. Because right next to the winery here, we have a block of Pinot that's never made decent red wine so for a long time we we just harvest it a little bit early press it off and it would invariably be blended away into some village chardonnay but then during fermentation of those lots we thought you know that looks kind of champagne like yeah and uh so in 2012 we we took the step of harvesting not just all of that Pinot Noir, but also a little bit of Chardonnay a bit early mm. and, and start making sparkling wine. And that's, that's great. That's been fun. I mean, that's got to be, uh, well, not that you don't have so much going on anyway that you wouldn't be invigorated, but reinvigorating to start to go down yeah. the sparkling. I always say that, uh, you know, you could show me a lot of different wineries and there's some cool toys and this and that, and I can go on a wine tour and, yeah, that's, you know, but when you, I go to a sparkling production, it's, you, you know, it's like a clean slate, and I'm just fascinated by everything, you know. Um, we went to uh, French Accorta a few years ago, so my wife's kind of from that area. And uh, Berlucci is the old producer there. They're the first ones, and they're, which was only 1961, but, mm-hmm. you know, they, they, you know it's a castle, and it's just a gorgeous property and everything. But the, it just blew my mind that, you know, their cheapest wine, which was excellent, was five years before it gets released yeah. you know and, and you just think 
you know, how can they do it? How can they do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, I've always said, you know, if you actually sat down and worked out the economics of making sparkling wine, you'd never do it. Yeah. You just, so, so you just go and do it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and worry about it later. It's the same, the same can be said. I, I was in Spain recently in, uh, in Jerez and, you know, visiting bodegas and they've got these soleras that are incredible. Yeah. And I go, how can they sell this wine so cheaply? Yeah. You know, all, it's just have all it this investment and, um, and working capital. And it's the same with sparkling wine, but, mm. which is why we're starting out in a small way. You know, the yeah. first couple of years were about 3,000 bottles. I think we're up to about 4,500 bottles now. Is that released yet? I'm just trying yeah. to think of it. I'll, yeah. I'll have to keep an eye out for some yeah. of that. We call it Cremon. Cremon. So, Cremon. Oh, I have seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Haven't had the pleasure of drinking any yet, though, so maybe on my way out. Um, well, great, man. Uh, oh, one more question. I don't know. Is the, uh, as driving in, I was reminded again, is it the liar system yep. outside? Is that a, any connection from when you knew Richard Smart? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that goes back to the days when I was doing my third year project. Uh, it was based on some vineyards in Kunawara where we were comparing uh, a wide T trellis with a Geneva double curtain mm -hmm. with uh, a trellis where we actually increased the shade by wrapping it in bird netting and with their standard trellis. So um, because we, we already had vineyards planted and they were quite widely spaced, between three and three and a half metres wide, um, the fastest way we could improve the microclimate was to divide the canopy somehow uh, and GDC was an obvious way of doing that, mm -hmm. the Geneva double curtain. The problem with it being that if, when you grow a vine upside down, a few of them like it, and Concord in um, New York, they're fine. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of Pinot Noir is fine, but varieties like Chardonnay and Cabernet don't like it at all. So um, we went down the path of planting some new vineyards and doing it with a liar trellis, which is you know dividing the canopy and growing it upwards. Mm. And I, I did get to meet Alan Carbono with, uh, with Richard. So he, he was then working in La Trenne in Bordeaux, visited the uh, research station there and read up a lot about the Carbono U trellis or liar trellis. And that's why we went down that path. But um, if we were to do it all again, we would go back to narrow rows. Narrows, yeah. It's, We're easier it's to just, work. Yeah. It's much easier to sit up and work. And that, that's certainly what we have now at Rays Road in Hawke's Bay, uh, an existing vineyard with 2.2 metre rows, and that, that seems to work mm. with, with the machinery that we have. I think you can do it narrower as well, but, but really at that point you want to go over the row. Yeah. So, so you're looking at enjambeur tractors. Um, but for the time being, here in Kumu, we... All of our own vineyards are on liar and it works very well, but it is expensive to yeah, establish yeah. and expensive to run. I'm sure Millen would like to see it gone, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's still there and it's still doing a job yeah, and, exactly. and it has for a long time. Yeah. Cool. Well, I, I guess I'll finish off by saying uh, when you're in Hawke's Bay, shoot me a note and uh, uh, I'm sure you got plenty of friends down there, but uh, come by and taste some wines. And, uh, Love to. Thanks Thank for, for doing this. I really Pleasure. appreciate it. Cheers. Thank you, Michael. That was great that you did that uh, and got me through my big coffee spill right in the beginning. I've never done anything like that. That was ridiculous, and uh, you were an absolute gentleman. I appreciate that and making sure my equipment didn't get uh, wet with coffee. Uh, if you guys are in Auckland or passing through, make your way over to their tasting room uh, at Kumi River. Great people, lots of history, and the wines are no joke, man. They're just beautiful wines. They are at kumeriver.co.nz. That's K-U-M-E-U river.co.nz. And uh, at kumi underscore river on Instagram. As I said in the intro, I'm off to the U.S. for a bit of sales and events. I'll be in Oklahoma for Artists and Fine Wines trade show. That's on September 11th in Oklahoma City, September 12th in Tulsa, then down to Houston, then off to New York, New Jersey, for a uh, including a couple events in Philadelphia, although that's in Pennsylvania. 
Uh, we're going to do a little trade tasting on the evening of the 19th, which is a Wednesday. And we're going to have some family and friends there. So if you finish up your shift and you want to swing by McCrossens, Jason from Para 2 and I will have some great things open uh, for your free enjoyment. Uh, the rest of your bar tab won't be free. I'll say that ahead of time, but we're going to have a couple uh, new releases and things open for you guys to taste. Uh, we really hope you can come by. It'll kind of be our only little public thing we're doing in Philadelphia because I have a private event on the night of the 21st. But I'll also be at the Hershey Hotel Wine Festival on Sunday the 16th. Looking forward to pouring wine in the land of chocolate. So oh, I'll be posting when I can a crazy trip ahead of us uh, on you know Instagram, Twitter, a lot of stuff on Instagram. Decibel Wines up on Facebook is all linked in too if you want to reach out to me. Uh, of course, decibelwines.com. Use the promo code DBPODCAST to receive 10% off your first order. And thanks to Kari Wine for sponsoring this season. Uh, I think it's been the best season yet. Uh, hopefully I'm getting better at doing this and you guys are finding it enjoyable in these conversations. I know I've had fun doing it and, uh, it's getting a little bit bigger. There's a few more people out there listening and really it's my curiosity that is driving this thing. And I hope you guys are finding some answers along with me. Uh, thanks so much for listening. I'll talk to you soon. Cheers. Cheers.